What is the self? Welcome to this lesson where we'll talk about the neuroscience, the sense of self, and also how it relates to meditation practice and tools we can use for deconstructing the self so that we can have a mind that's more fluid and less kind of rigid ways of thinking. But first, let's just start by looking at our own experience. What does it feel like you are? Sometimes we say like me as in referring to the body and then sometimes we have a body, like when we say my body. And the sense of self, it, it seems it's always changing. It can even sometimes feel like we are a part of like the sports team that we're cheering for when we say we're winning or you know, I'm parked over there as if our car were us. And there's five main categories of our experience that it's said that could be the self could identify with. And that is our body, our feelings, our thoughts, our decision making, like the one who's making the choices and awareness itself. And traditionally, these are the five khandhas or the five heaps that Siddhartha Gautama the historical Buddha talked about, and he said, none of these are a self. And if we take any of these to be a self, it's liable to cause us suffering. In neuroscience too, when we peer into the brain, well, there's no little mini me up there pressing buttons, even though it can feel like sometimes we're kind of up here in the head, peering out of our eyes. But you look in the brain and there's just the, a few networks that toggle and any of these could feel like our self at a given moment. A major one is the narrative self, which is linked to the default mode network, a connection of brain regions that come online when we're like thinking about our life experiences or thinking thoughts related to ourselves. So the experiencing self is when we're kind of this embodied present moment self that's experiencing the world around us and moving about. So we're, we're no longer lost in our thoughts, but we're kind of, it might feel like we are the body itself. And this involves different brain networks. It can involve the interoceptive system, can include parts of the brainstem and midbrain structures. And it could be associated with the salience network. It, it really you know, this is a simplification of a lot of complex processes. The third type of self is sometimes called selfless, or this pure awareness that we can get to in deeper states of meditation. It also might be related to the, the dreamless sleep state when there's just awareness without any content in it, without any dreams. And so as you go deeper in your practice, you might notice there's this just a level of alertness there, like a, an awareness, but nothing in the mind. And that's been linked to the ascending reticular arousal system. So this is a little bit theoretical, but we can see how these three groups of self relate to brain networks. And there's no one network that we could call the self. There's another framework for thinking about the selves that I find useful, and that is these are like automatic programs in the brain that come online depending on certain situations that we're faced with. And they have, in the predictive processing framework, they have reliably resolved prediction errors in the past. So for example, maybe there's a sense of self that is your self at work, and it knows how to deal with coworkers, make them know that you're in charge and it won't get you in trouble or whatever it is. This is like a program in the brain that knows, all right, I behave like this around these people or in this situation. And maybe there's a completely different sense of self that comes online when you're with your family at home or talking to a friend at the coffee shop. You can begin to notice throughout the day how the sense of self changes depending on the context. And this can help us realize that the self is a bit fluid. But the problem is when there's, there could be a maladaptive like program playing out in the brain. So say you had a bad experience when you were younger, somebody was rude to you, or a teacher said something that made you feel shameful. 
So you might have developed a sense of self as like a defense mechanism that is meant to deal with this type of scenario and it overgeneralizes to similar situations that put us into these emotionally reactive modes of being from similar situations that we encounter. And so we might feel like anger at a certain person or situation over and over again, because in the past we conditioned this type of self to come online to, to deal with that situation. Now, when teachers came to Siddhartha Gautama and tried to debate him with their beliefs about a self, he would often respond by talking about dependent origination and how everything in our experience, everything in the mind is built from smaller and smaller pieces. And this includes the self, which ultimately, when you look closely at the mind, you know, it can be some thoughts in our head, or it can just be a bundle of feelings in the body that we take to be ourselves in a given moment. And these kind of snowball into larger and larger sense of self. So there could be a whole belief about this is who I am. This is what I believe. And, and it all came from, well, smaller pieces like thoughts and concepts, things we've seen and heard and other people have said to us. And so in meditation, you can start to see how this process works. Both meditation and psychedelics have been theorized to increase the entropy in the brain, the kind of chaos in the brain in a way that allows our more rigid sense of self to relax. And so this team at Harvard that is researching jhana wrote that disrupting the self-related processing and increasing brain entropy, Akam J, or in other words, jhana, appears to relax overestimated priors, which is to say like beliefs in the brain, reducing default mode network activity while enhancing parietal network activity to enhance bottom-up perceptual processing. More simply put, this meditation has been shown to bring us more into the present moment where we gather the information that's closer to the here and now and further away from these concepts and stories that we have in our like higher in our neural layers that can create a sense of self that's based on like a story in our mind and there was a 2013 study by an israeli group that looked at 12 expert meditators who reported these blissful states of selfless awareness. And they were shown to deconstruct their sense of self through the practice. So starting with their narrative sense of self, then they went to this more kind of minimal self where they're just the experiencer or the, the controller. And then lastly, to a selfless, pure awareness and the brain activity that was measured using a magnetoencephalogram seemed to match their subjective descriptions based on the neural activity, the parts of the brain that were deactivated as they meditated and went deeper in their practice. So on a micro level, as we train, we can get these insights that the self is more of a fluid process. And on the macro level, mental fitness is largely about reducing our self-centeredness, realizing that these self-centered states, well, they created a contracted state of mind and they cause us a lot of dukkha, a lot of suffering. So we can begin to relish in more selfless states where we help others and we're humble and we um, start to diminish that kind of rigid self-centered thinking that causes us to tighten up and contract. And this decreased rigidity has been identified as a key component of mental health and it's been linked to psychological well-being. So one practical way to do this is just to laugh more at our, with ourselves, you know, to laugh when we're getting so serious with ourselves and kind of shake up our internal model about how we think we are and how others should treat us or how right we think we are. And we can apply the four R's here too and just recognize when we're kind of selfing and then release and open the mind like a fist and 
ah, it feels good to just relax out of that tight sense of self and then relish and see, okay, who can I help here? Why don't I connect to others and think about them for a moment instead of thinking about myself? And ah, that feels good. And then remain in that mode of being. It's like an entirely different mode of perceiving the world. And it's really blissful. And so thanks for hearing me out about our sense of self and some of the science. I hope this was helpful. And your daily challenge today is just to notice when your sense of self becomes strong and to soften that, to use the four R's. Have a wonderful day and I'll see you tomorrow for some more training.